Persatuan Kebangsaan Autisma Malaysia atau lebih dikenali sebagai NARSO Pada 3 Mac 1987, NARSO telah didaftarkan sebagai sebuah organisasi kebajikan yang berdaftar di bawah ROS NARSO telah menetapkan objektif utama untuk menyediakan pelbagai penyimatan sokongan untuk membantu individu autisma terutamanya kanak-kanak dan ahli keluarga terdekat Pusat NASU pertama telah dibuka di Titiwangsa pada tahun 1988 dengan jumlah murid kurang dari 20 orang. Sebagai pusat intervensi awal, NASU menerima anak-anak seawal 3 tahun hingga 12 tahun sebagai pelajar. Pelbagai kemahiran seperti kemahiran mengurus diri, interaksi sosial dan komunikasi, dan akademik dan pengurusan tingkat laku diberikan sebagai persediaan sebelum mereka melangkah ke alam sekolah. Nasu juga membantu mereka supaya lebih berdekatan. Kini, Nasu memiliki sebuah sebuah pusat intervensi awal hampir di seluruh Malaysia termasuk di Sabah. Anak-anak autisma yang meningkat dewasa mempunyai kesukaran untuk mendapat tempat dalam masyarakat. Namun, di pusat vokasional Nasu, mereka akan diambilkan. Pada tahun 1999, di Kucai Lama dan di Bengkel Daya Kelang, Pusat vokasional pertama telah berjaya ditubuhkan dengan menyediakan modul kemahiran vokasional seperti pembuatan roti, penyediaan makanan dan lain-lain. Mereka diajar untuk menguasai teknik kemahiran agar mampu berdikari atau bekerja di luar. Selain menyediakan program intervensi awal dan vokasional, Nasun juga mempunyai sebuah pusat terapi yang menyediakan perkhidmatan ujian saringan diagnosis, perkhidmatan terapi seperti terapi pemulihan cara kerja, terapi blok, terapi tingkah laku dan program intensif intervensi secara perseorangan dan program teknik secara berkumpulan. Pada tahun 2005, pusat terapi Nasun mulai ditubuhkan di Jalan Pahal sebelum berpindah ke Setia Alam pada tahun 2012. Terapi di Nasun bukan sahaja menyediakan perkhidmatan ujian saringan dan juga program terapi, tetapi juga menyediakan perkhidmatan konsultasi bagi ibu bapa dan juga memberi ceramah, latihan serta bengkel untuk guru, ibu bapa dan orang tua. Sebagai sebuah NGO, Nasun bergantung sepenuhnya pada bayaran yuran pelajar dan sumbangan dari barang korporat dan orang tua. Setiap sumbangan uang ringgit layak menerima misi dan jualan juga. Setiap sokongan serta bantuan anda akan membantu kami di masa untuk terus beroperasi di masa hadapan. Sebarang pertanyaan berkenaan autisma atau NASO, anda boleh menghubungi kami seperti berikut.
All right. Very good evening, Dr. Dr. Rajini, and to all our audience out there. And we want to thank you for joining us. We're so privileged today being World Autism Day. And we've seen a lot of celebrations going on, and it's really gotten much, much better that the awareness is there right now. And um, we're so privileged, we're so thankful to have Dr. Dr. Rajini with us today, uh, speaking on Nasom's platform. And I know a lot of you have been so excited. You've been, you know, texting us. You've been asking us, "Are you sure it is Dr. Dr. Rajini, the one that that you know?" We have to wait like about two years sometimes to actually get an appointment with her. Yes, it's none other than Dr. Rajini Sarvanandan who is a consultant, developmental and general pediatrician at Park City Medical Center, baby and beyond child specialist clinic and a visiting consultant at UMMC. And most importantly, she takes great pride in her role as a mother to her three beautiful daughters, a wife, a daughter and a friend to a lot of us. Thank you, Dr. Rajini. And it's all yours now. Thanks. Thank you, Anne. Um, good evening to everyone. Um, it's Good Friday today um, and a very blessed day for us to be meeting here today. And um, I just would like to wish everyone a happy World Autism Awareness Day. Um, thank you for spending your Friday evening with us. Um, so, you know, when Anne um, wrote to me to say, you know, would you talk? And I didn't have any hesitation. And she said to me, will you talk about something related to COVID? Um, at first I thought, oh no, is everybody overwhelmed? Um, has had too much information? Um, but I think it's probably important because it's essentially taken over our lives for this last one year. Um, I think, uh, it's not going to go away. And I think hopefully as we carry on in this pandemic that we all uh, continue to learn from it and be better prepared when there are ups and downs um, so that we can help our children navigate through these difficult times. Um, I'm going to see um, if I can share my screen okay so just bear with me a minute while i try to share my slides um as you can see i'm not a very tech savvy person but i am going to try um and can i just check that you can see my slides yes yes we can see for those who cannot okay. see could you leave the chat we will try and address it for you Okay. Um, if you can't see, it doesn't matter. A lot of it is words, some pictures, a lot of information that probably you've heard, but I just wanted to put it in perspective. And um, maybe this can be um, something we use as a platform for discussion. Um, so autism and COVID-19, um, how it presents and how it's impacted our lives. So essentially what I wanted to talk about was, this is more of a guide for me than it is, I think for anyone else is, what is COVID-19 um, and how, how does it present itself in children with autism spectrum disorder? Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of talk about whether or not children with uh, developmental disabilities were gonna be more at risk. Um, I'm going to touch a little bit more about that because we here we are a year on. Um, I think a bigger problem has been the impact of the whole pandemic on children, families um, and societies and really what we can do um, to cope with it from here on because it's, it's not going away. So we all know that it's caused by this pretty little virus that, you know, so many children that I see in my clinic seem to know about it. And, um, you know, some of them probably just regurgitate what parents have said to them. Um, some of them seem to understand maybe a little bit more, like it's going to make my lungs um, hurt or it's going to make me have a bad cough and uh, I don't want to go to hospital, that sort of thing. Um, but um, I think it's important to know that, yes, it is from the same family of viruses that causes uh, the common cold, but it can also cause a more 
the, the viruses from this family can cause more severe infections. Those of you who um, were around in 2003 may have heard of the SARS virus, which luckily for Malaysia, we, we essentially escaped uh, the brunt of it. But our neighbours, Singapore, Hong Kong, um, Canada, they, they were affected by this. Um, but, you know, the, the, the coronavirus is the one that gives us the common cold, you know, where we go around sniffing, coughing a little, maybe a bit of fever. But the COVID-19 virus um, seems to do that and, and how it affects different people. It, you know, it, just like there's a spectrum in autism, the illness is a spectrum in, in people who are infected, infected with COVID-19. The origin, it's a big debate, but I think um, we can all agree it's most likely from animals. So um, we first heard about it in the medical world at the end of December um, when there was a bit of an hour, uh, there was an, a case of pneumonia, uh, cases of pneumonia um, in Wuhan. Um, and then subsequently in at the end of January, we were told that this was a public health emergency. And by March 11th, um, it was declared a pandemic. Um, and here we are uh, still in the midst of the pandemic with no end to sight. Um, I think this has been uh, the biggest impact on, our, on us. Um, as a result of the pandemic, the government had to introduce movement control orders um, just like they had to in numerous other countries. I think in Malaysia, a lot of us can say we were totally confused about all the different C's and O's where we are right now because the first MCO and the, the most recent MCO were different. The rules were different. CMCO back in June and CMCO currently is different. I don't know whether we are in RMCO or CMCO right now, but all I know is we still have to be very careful. And, you know, um, I think this timeline shows it very clearly. Um, and probably things may keep changing. And this is something we have to be prepared for. So why, why all these different movement control orders? Because we know that this is a very infectious virus. It spreads very quickly. Probably its infectivity rate is is well its infectivity rate is higher than something like influenza um and because when a lot of people are infected we know that a certain number then become very ill and that then overwhelms our medical health system so as most of you know there was a little bit of a panic earlier this year in january when we suddenly saw an escalation in the number of cases and the ICU beds started to be full and, you know, private hospitals were roped in to also take on cases because there was a sudden rise in the number of cases. And although our mortality rate, the number of people dying from COVID-19 is well under 1% in Malaysia, um, I think it's something like 0.3%, um, we still have uh, about 10% who end up in ICU. And, you know, that stretches our health services. So how does it get transmitted? Um, we know that uh, droplet transmission uh, is the main way of transmission. So what are droplets? What's the difference between droplet transmission and airborne transmission? It's to do with the size of the droplets. So when you cough, you get big droplets of mucus and saliva. Some of them you feel, yeah, when someone coughs or even you cough, um, you do see droplets on your table or on your computer screen. And um, some of the droplets are not visible to the eye. So we say droplets are anything that are more than five microns. When we talk about airborne transmissions, these are even smaller microscopic um, uh, particles that we cannot see with our naked eye. And these actually um, happen when we talk. So not that sudden burst of air that comes out when we cough or sneeze, 
but just generally when we're talking, um, we produce little tiny particles. And these tiny particles can hang around in the air for a little bit longer um, before they settle on a surface. So in the past, people thought it was only when you cough and sneeze that um, you may transmit it. But we know that airborne transmission happens as well. Hence the importance of wearing face masks. The other um, way that it transmits itself is foodborne. So, um, you know, people talk about going to to do their shopping in the market or so what happens is then food that gets contaminated um, and then if you don't clean or wash your food you ingest the virus that may be sitting on the surface of your food um, especially if the food is not cooked um, and especially if that you know someone digs into the shopping bag before you can actually unpack wash and put it away um, and then that person ingests the virus and it can actually go through your, your intestines into your body and, and then to your lungs. Or somebody touches contaminated food, touches their face, especially around their nose and mouth, and inhales it as a result of that. So different ways of how it can happen. And we know when viruses land on surfaces, they can last for days sometimes, yeah? Um, and hence the reason why we keep talking about um, cleaning surfaces with disinfectants or wiping them down with disinfectant wipes, using gloves as well. Um, it's to try and get rid of the viruses. Now, the good thing is this virus washes off easily and it gets killed by most disinfectants, household disinfectants. So how does it present itself in children? So when we talk about incubation period, we talk about um, when you first meet the virus. For example, if you say happen to meet someone who coughs um, accidentally or you shake hands with that person and you touch your face and, and you don't realize that person had the virus, that virus can incubate in your body and uh, multiply. Um, before it starts to show symptoms. Any, so you can show symptoms anywhere between two and 14 days from when you first came into contact with that virus. On average, it's about six days. And if you look at children who have um, signs and symptoms of COVID-19, commonest ones are the first two, the fever and the cough. Yeah, um, And then you get non-specific um, aching muscles, tiredness, headaches, uh, nasal congestion. So I highlighted loss of taste or smell and I highlighted abdominal pain, diarrhea, nausea and vomiting because we know that younger people um, uh, tend to have this problem um, more um, especially in children. Sometimes the first presentation can actually just be um, uh, diarrhea, vomiting, loss of appetite before they actually show signs of fever and cough as well. So it can be very much like any other viral illness, which makes it more difficult. The good news is almost half of the children are sim are, don't have symptoms. Yeah, So that's good news for our children. But that also poses a problem because then if they go on to meet their grandparents or someone who is at risk, then they are going to be spreaders. Um, and when I'm, I'm putting children in, on the autism spectrum under the group of children, yeah, children zero to 17 years, yeah, because there hasn't been much evidence to tell us that children with autism spectrum present any differently. Um, most children have mild symptoms and admissions to hospital worldwide is much lower than in adults. You may have heard stories of children having what they call um, uh, multi-organ failure, etc., something like a Kawasaki disease. But to be honest, um, that presentation in Malaysia has not been really seen, except in children who have um, 
risk factors of underlying immune uh, compromise. So um, the children with more complex medical problems, if they have an underlying genetic, neurological, metabolic disorder, and when I talk about metabolic disorder, I'm also including children who have obesity and diabetes, or children who have a congenital heart disease or a respiratory problem, they might be more at risk for severe illness if they get COVID. So they're not more likely to get COVID, but if they do come in contact with the virus, they are more likely to have severe illness. And actually worldwide, people have looked at children who have been admitted with COVID the number one risk factor is actually still obesity. More recently, people talk, have talked about vitamin D. Now, we know in um, adults, you are more likely to have vitamin D deficiency, um, especially in people of um, colored skin. Yeah. So um, if you look at uh, the US and the UK, they have talked about Black and Hispanic people um, and Asians um, uh, having a more severe disease. And when they've looked at vitamin D levels, they have said that um, uh, most of them have lower vitamin D levels or vitamin D deficiency. In children, like I said, because most of them are asymptomatic, when they've looked at in one country, for example, Turkey, they looked at um, children admitted with COVID-19. And what they did find was there were lower vitamin D levels in the children who were admitted compared to those who were not admitted with um, COVID-19. So I put a question mark because everybody says we need to look at more studies um, to really confirm this in children. So is there an increased risk of getting COVID-19 infection for our children with autism spectrum disorder? No, unless they have one of the risk factors that I mentioned. So a neurological problem, a metabolic problem, they have obesity, um, possibly if they have vitamin D deficiency, but again, we don't know about that. But I, 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 I will talk about it a little bit more. But we know people who don't wear a face mask are more at risk of getting COVID-19 and are also um, going to be spreading it more. Yeah, So this can be a problem amongst our children because many of them have some sensory issues which prevent them from having uh, wearing a face mask or a face covering. But again, you know, it's something that we can work around. So essentially, the statement now is that there is no evidence to suggest an increased risk of COVID-19 in children with ASD or any other developmental disorder if they do not have underlying health conditions. One thing to note, though, is a nutri the nutritional status of the child is very, very important when it comes to getting any sort of disease when it comes to their immune system. Yeah, So not just COVID-19 that we should be worrying about, but other infections as well. If your child's nutritional status is poor, and when I mean your nutritional status is poor, I don't mean just looking at their weight and height, but also making sure that they're taking a well-balanced diet with micronutrients, um, vitamins from natural foods. If they, if they don't um, take in enough of these micronutrients, that can affect their immunity as well. And there have been studies also looking at vitamin D status in children with autism spectrum disorder. And many studies have found that actually vitamin D deficiency is a problem in children with autism spectrum disorder. So it is something that we probably should look at um, within our own children itself. How do you diagnose COVID-19? And often, you know, when I've spoken to families, um, this has been their biggest nightmare. How are they going to take a swab from my child? Well, um, if I'm very honest with you, we have been doing these swabs. They're called nasopharyngeal swabs, uh, where it goes through the nose and to the space 
between the back of your nose and your throat, this is the best place to detect the virus because this is also where you get most of your mucus in children. So um, in children, throat swabs may not be as reliable because if you look, if you poke the, put the swab in there, you may hit further down here and you may not get the best sample um, to detect the virus. Um, in KKM, they would probably do both the throat and the nose. Um, but in children, if we have to choose one, we would definitely choose the nasopharyngeal swab. And if I'm very honest with you, pediatricians have been doing this a lot in children who are admitted to hospital previously, um, children who are suspe suspected of having influenza, etc. And the biggest problem is often um, making sure the child stays still. Um, but it's the same with looking at your child's ears and throat. Um, and, you know, I, I always um, joke with the staff who work with me. I always say to them, you know, if you're going to be working with me, you need to be comfortable holding children. And I'm not just talking about children with autism. I'm talking about any child who, who is scared of medical procedures. Um, and so... I want to reassure parents that, you know, most of uh, the places that are doing swabs are very familiar with doing children, especially if the one, especially the ones who are where they often have been doing it in children. So if you're talking about um, uh, KKM, most of the clinics and the hospitals are extremely familiar with this now a year on you're talking about private hospitals yes some gps may not be comfortable doing it uh, on children and they will tell you so but increasingly more and more uh, gps are doing it and are comfortable doing it there is no reliable blood or saliva test in children a lot of parents ask me this so what happens if we make a diagnosis so if the diagnosis is made in kkm any of the KKM facilities, um, KKM is Kementerian Kesehatan Malaysia, then, um, you know, that kicks in uh, the whole chain where they will um, uh, uh, decide whether or not you need to be admitted, etc. If the diagnosis is made in another clinic or private hospital, they will notify KKM. Um, there's already an automatic procedure where this happens and someone from um, the COVID response team will decide, will call up, talk to the family and decide if there is a need for admission um, to hospital based on symptoms and the risk score that they calculate. Um, and contacts will be swabbed and you can actually request for it to be done privately at home uh, by KKM if you have a child with special needs um, or an adult with special needs, or you can actually call a private GP that you may know as well to come to your home. So there are home-based services. Um, in January, when there was a sudden rise in cases, KKM was overwhelmed. But I have to say, um, I had a family um, where um, the mother actually was the one who was COVID positive, and she passed it on to the rest of her family at home. So there were four adults, two older daughters um, who were above 18 and a son who was eight years old with autism spectrum disorder. So when mom found out she was positive, she explained that she had a son at home um, and they live in a PPR flat and um, she was did not want to bring him to the clinic Kesehatan to have the swab. So the team from KK, uh, KKIA were actually very good and they did a home visit to do the swab at home, um, and thankfully he was negative. They agreed to allow, um, so mum, the mother, the father, one of the sisters was positive. They agreed to allow the family to stay at home, in their home, and telephone contact was made. And when his sister were, uh, developed fever, they did insist that the sister leave and get admitted, but the mother, the father, um, and the two children uh, were allowed to stay at home and see out their quarantine period um, at home. So what I want to reassure parents is that, you know, it's not like someone's going to come in an ambulance, 
put your child in the ambulance, drive away without you. All children or people who are unable to care for themselves are allowed to have a relative with them. Definitely, if you have a child, regardless of whether your child has special needs or not, your child will always be accompanied by either you or father or a named relative. Um, so it's not like they're going to be separated from you. So um, if we want to avoid it, prevention, prevention, prevention. And, you know, we know how the virus spreads, hence why we say face masks or face coverings are very important. Um, physical distancing, not social distancing, is important. Hand washing, um, making sure that you sanitize surfaces, you clean your hands often, you clean things that you bring into the house, you know, common sense things like make sure when you come home, you take a shower, etc. This is often the biggest challenge, how we explain COVID-19 to our children. And, uh, you know, one thing that um, COVID-19 taught us in the world of uh, people with different needs is how everyone is so willing to help each other. Um, you know, uh, I have friends um, from when I trained overseas who were in touch with me. And, you know, they were sending me resources from there. I was getting families telling me, oh, you know, we did this with our child, a social story, doctor, if you want to share it with your families. Um, and it was amazing how people came together. But I think this is extremely important that we need to explain COVID-19 to our children, um, especially our children who may not be able to take information when it's explained to them as a group, in a classroom or in a centre. They need us as parents to explain this to them. So I'm just going to share an example. Um, and this is one that... Uh, was actually highlighted to me by one of my colleagues overseas, and I thought it was very cute. Um, so um, it was actually done by a, um, a group, I think in Spain, um, uh, working with children with autism. So it says, hello, I am a virus, a cousin with the flu and the common cold. I love to travel and jump from hand to hand to say hi. So trying to tell children that they can't give hive hives. Have you heard about me? And how do you feel when you hear my name? And I think this is extremely important. I can understand you feel sad, angry, scared, and you can add in your own emotion. I would feel the same way. Sometimes adults get worried when they read the news or see me on TV. And I don't know if you look back a year ago, um, how you felt. Um, it was very scary. I think for a lot of us, um, it was the fear of the unknown. Um, media always highlights um, things that are bad. But I can tell you in some countries, things were really bad. And we, were, we have been so lucky here in Malaysia. Um, but I know at that time, it was a very scary time for me. Um, my husband um, volunteered to work on the COVID wards. Um, I had children who I needed to bring back from overseas. And then I had my daughter, but I still had my work. Parents were calling up the clinic, so I did not want to close the clinic. So, And then I had my mother who, you know, has been my rock in helping me look after my children and I wanted to protect her. So we had to cut off a lot of ties and, you know, keeping in touch with her. Although she just lived five minutes away, we were on FaceTime every day or WhatsApp call. And it was scary reading the news. And I know for my daughter, especially my youngest daughter, although she's a teenager, um, she was really scared. And especially when I did grocery shopping for my mother, she would insist that, you know, I bring it back. Let's clean it before we send it to her, you know, things like that. So I am going to explain myself so you can understand. When I come to visit, I bring fever, cough, difficulty breathing. But I don't stay with people for long and almost everyone gets better. And that's true. Just like when you scrape on your knee, you get a scrape on your knee and it heals. 
and you say bye-bye to me. It's normal to worry, but the adults who take care of you, like mummy and daddy, will keep you safe. And you can help by washing your hands with soap and water while singing a song. So remember, we sing a song because that tells us how long we want to wash our hands. By using hand sanitizer and letting it dry on your hands without moving, count to 10. And once your dry hands are dry, you can go back to playing. And if you do all that and stay at home, it helps to stop me visiting so many people while the doctors work to find a vaccine. Well, now we've got vaccines. But, you know, this was something that I thought was good. And we could use it for preschoolers. We could use it for children with autism. There were also simpler versions. Um, and, you know, I think explaining it is extremely, extremely important um, because um, children need to know that. So that's the first thing. It's important to know that in children, the effects of the pandemic is a bigger problem than the infection itself. So I asked my daughter, um, when schools got locked down, um, again, back in October, um, she was very upset. So I said, why are you upset? What is it you're going to miss? So this is the perspective from a teenager. Social isolation, lack of exercise, loss of routine. And she actually said to me, you know, it's more traumatic listening and watching all this news and listening to you and Papa talk um, about what's going on. Um, so, you know, that was a perspective from a teenager. But she could express this. What about our own children? So in children with autism spectrum disorder. There's been a lot of research looking at this here, yeah. um, but it's common sense, right? A lot of our children have developed anxiety. Many of them were often anxious about different things, but here was a bigger problem um, that affected their lives. This time, the people that they relied on, i.e. mummy, daddy, maybe grandma, um, kaka, uh, ade, who are usually very calm, were also anxious, yeah? There's the loss of the routine that often kept them going. Social isolation, people always say that children with autism spectrum uh, disorder love living at home, loves being at home or being isolated, but that's not true. And I think all of you who have children on the spectrum will know they, are, they actually like social interaction just at different levels and sometimes being stuck at home with people that you're not used to especially if mommy and daddy haven't really spent that much time at home can be stressful as we found out as a family and then there's the lack of intervention and support that families also felt yeah for parents who pretty much relied on daycares intervention centers um, in helping their children while they were at work they were now at home, working from home without that support. So that was very stressful for parents and that further feeds into the anxiety in children. But how do we manage that? Yeah, I think, you know, I can go into depth, but I just thought about points that maybe we can take away. First of all is acknowledging your child's anxiety and acknowledging that how they express it is going to be different depending on their level of anxiety and what is making them anxious. So it's important that we understand why they may be anxious. We may not really get to the real reason, but we try to as much as possible to understand that. We also have to understand that the triggers of anxiety can be different for different individuals. So for some children, being up, stuck at home, is more stressful than going out to school or the fact that they can't go outdoors um, or the fact that they are not meeting their friends or having that different um, environment that they're used to and their routine is, is, is disrupted. So then how you deal with it is also important. So how you deal with it can be broken down into one, ensuring you have some calming strategies, ensuring you have some coping strategies, and ensuring that you have 
a good sleep hygiene. And what I mean by sleep hygiene is making sure that your child is ready for a good night's sleep when it's time to sleep. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about calming and coping strategies. But I really want to stress on sleep because many of our children already have sleep uh, difficulties. And I don't know about many of you, but during the pandemic, especially during the first lockdown, when we were all confined to our homes, um, we as a family had problems sleeping because we are used to going outdoors in the evenings, at weekends, and, you know, outdoor exercise was uh, very important for us. And we were finding that we were spending more time as a family in front of the screen uh, because we couldn't do stuff together outside. And so we were all sleeping later, um, still having to wake up to go to work and do online schooling. Um, but it made us grumpier. It made us fight more. And, you know, we, we had to tell ourselves that we had to go back to it. I used to be very particular about restricting screen time with my children. All that went out of the window during the pandemic. Um, and even for myself, you know, I don't know if you know, but... Um, so Apple gives you a summary of how many percent your screen time has increased or reduced. Uh, I hate to, to, to confess what happened to mine. So what about calming strategies? Um, find a space in your house or a room where you can make it a, a calming sensory room. And when we talk about sensory rooms, we don't mean you have to have a swing or something like that. Throwing in some cushions throwing in some Play-Doh or slime in that room, um, you know, having a yoga mat so that they can just roll around, having different things that your child enjoys in terms of sensory-seeking behavior. Have that corner or have that space in your room. That can also be the place that you go to to calm down for yourself when you are stressed or raising your voice or you feel tensions are running high. Deep breathing. So, it's easy to teach children deep breathing by getting them to imitate you. But for children who find that they, it doesn't make sense or they don't know how to do it properly, we can use objects. So, for example, um, if you have, um, you know, uh, simplest one is like a flower or a feather. Um, you take a deep breath through your nose and you blow out through your mouth so the feather moves. Or if you have you know, plants or leaves in your house, you know, you can put it in a bowl and you can say, deep breath in your nose and breathe out and let's see if we can scatter the leaves in that big bowl or big basin. Um, and you do that about 10 times, yeah. Um, exercise. I know during the first lockdown, we were all confined to our homes. But since then, with the recent MCO, many families were confused, and I don't blame you all because the SOPs keep changing. But during the recent MCO, they actually said two people were allowed to go outdoors. And actually, um, there, was a, there was a lot more leniency given to people with special needs um, in that you could go out as a threesome as long as you had some evidence to show that your child had a, a, a different need or you know a disability. The concept of mindful walking it can be very calming. So this is when instead of just walking, you say today we're going to look at the clouds and let's see. Oh, can you see a uh, animal out there? Or today we're going to pick up leaves that we find that are big and we can show kids the example. Yeah, so that they focus their mind on something else or look for birds that are flying in the tree, um, or find flowers, or, you know, something to do with nature that, you know, um, doesn't excite them too much, that is calming as well. So maybe not cars or motorbikes, because some kids get extremely excited when they see a car drive past, or they see a car parked, but something that's calming. Um, getting a new routine going. When you get a new routine going, always remember to include out door exercise and calming sensory activities. Have visual strategies to explain the new routine, um, like why we have to stay at home again, why school is closed. Include daily chores and children, very young children can also help 
with daily chores. Children who have learning disabilities can help with daily chores, from wiping a table to carrying things into the kitchen, and make them fun. Yeah, Allow children to have worry time. So this was an interesting concept to me, and I heard this during a talk during the first lockdown, that it's okay to worry about what's going on. We all worry, yeah? But let's somehow express our worry in a different way. Um, and it's good for us to acknowledge that we are also worried. Social connections through video messaging if you can't do it physically. And at the day, end of the day, talk about the positive things that, things that have happened. And if your child is not verbal, we can even show them things that are positive that went on in their day by taking photos of fun activities that happened. Looking after you as a parent is the one of the most important things you can do for your child because your mental well-being will affect your child's mental health. And ensure you have some me time, whether it's just half an hour at the end of the day for you to do online shopping or just browse through catalogs or just watch something that is mindless, um, manage your anxiety and Please seek help if you need it. COVID is here to stay and it, the pandemic is going to continue. Even though we have vaccinations, um, vaccinations have been shown to help reduce spread. And as adults, I think we have a duty to ensure that we get vaccinated so that our children are protected. I'm glad to say I just had my second dose of vaccination yesterday and, you know, a bit of arm ache but I've been able to function as normally after both my vaccinations. Um, be prepared. Schools may close again. So we've got to get all these strategies ready so that they can kick in when we need to. So I call it your first aid kit. Yeah. And remember prevention, prevention, prevention. Thank you. I'm just going to stop sharing and then maybe we can take questions. Sorry, am I, are you muted, Anne? Uh... Sorry, can you hear me? I, I can't seem to hear you, Anne. Uh, I can't hear you. I'm not sure if Julian can. Oh, I see her audio is not working. Shall I just read out the first question? Oh, okay. So the first question is from Rowena. Um, if an autistic person is COVID positive and is held at host hospital, are there ways to enable parents to be with them during their quarantine and observation admission? Are there any cases so far that is known in Malaysia on the spectrum? So I'm assuming you're asking me if there have been any cases um, of children on the spectrum being admitted. Uh, yes, parents are allowed to be with them. Um, I know of... Uh, a teenager, not in the Klang Valley, who was admitted. Um, he was, I think, 14 or 15, and his parent was parent was allowed to be with him. Um, and I think they also tried uh, their very best to give them some privacy as well. So I think um, there is only one carer allowed in uh, with the child, unfortunately. And this person has to be swabbed, obviously, as a contact before, but also swabbed to make sure that um, we're aware of their COVID status as well. And um, But 
unfortunately, there cannot be a rotation, uh, meaning um, the parent goes in and then another parent comes in uh, for the evening shift. Unfortunately, that's not allowed. Um, so uh, carers are allowed, and I know this is also the case um, for older adults who may have disabilities as well. But this must be told to the health personnel when the swab is being um, taken as well. So I hope I've answered that question. Okay, Gayatri asks, children's behavior got worse or more challenging to cope with it's due to the lockdown or because of the parenting stress from parents themselves? Um, Gayatri, I think it's a combination of both. Um, I can tell you that uh, if you talk to parents of ch even neurotypical children, uh, as a mother, I can tell you my teenager's behavior did get worse. Um, but I think that was also because of my stress, because I had to worry about my mom as well. But I can tell you in my practice, I saw a lot of children um, acting out because one, their routine was lost. Two, parents were too scared, even when, um, even when the lockdown was lifted. I know a lot of families of children with special needs were very scared to let their children go out to playgrounds, taking their children out even for walks um, in the compound of their apartments or, or uh, flats um, because they were scared of things like, my child will touch the lift buttons and then you know he'll get COVID and I can't live with myself. So it was a combination um, of the... Um, stress that parents were having, which prevented them from being able to carry out the normal routines that I think also affected the child's behavior. So I think when we have children with behavior problems, we need to first look at what's changed, what's changed in our lives at home, or what may have changed in school. For example, I know children who went back to school after that first lockdown, and it was hard for them to adapt to the new SOPs. But when they went back again, after things were lifted in December, January, some of them adapted better because maybe they were prepared better in terms of change. So, yeah. So I hope I answered your question, Gayatri. Yeah, so, Doctor, uh, I think Anne's having some issues with uh, audio on her end. So... Uh, so I'll take over from here. Okay. All right. Um, by the way, I think, uh, just hold on. I think there's, let me see, there's one more question to show. Okay, just maybe just take one more. Okay. Is handling anxiety for people with high functioning autism different from other forms of autism? Um, Mikhail, I think for, uh, you know, personally, I, I try not to look at level of functioning from that perspective. What I look at is the age of the child. Um, what I look at is how the child is able to express themselves, whether they are better at expressing themselves through words or nonverbal means, because handling anxiety is about them being able to express anxiety as well. So, yes, it's different and not just different in terms of high functioning. I assume when we talk about high functioning, you talk about um, kids who are more able, verbal, maybe they are going to schools rather than specialist schools. I'm not sure. But I look at when we talk about handling anxiety, it really depends. And it also depends about the environment around the child. Yeah. And not just the family, but the, the extended family, the community. So one of the things that was interesting to me in my practice, and this also has been shown, is that when communities get together and form little bubbles, um, that families coped better. 
So I give you an example. The um, a family that I saw, they live in um, police quarters, so in you know uh, apartments. And what this one family did was because she had four children, of which three are on the spectrum, and two actually had quite difficult behaviors during the first lockdown. Um, her neighbors reached out to her because her husband was away a lot, um, working. He was a frontliner. She had to cope with it herself. Her neighbors reached out to her. And what they decided as a neighborhood was that the kids, uh, as a floor, was that the kids would come out and play in the corridor. They couldn't go downstairs. They couldn't go outdoors. But they would make their corridor a safe place. So they took turns to watch the kids, the older kids the mothers, etc. And that helped for that family. So um, the anxiety that she saw to the two children who were struggling with actually reduced. Interestingly, the child who struggled the most with anxiety was the child who was most able. He was going to a Skola Kebangsaan inclusive class, um, but he struggled the most because he couldn't cope with the fact that he couldn't go to school. So yes, it's different. Okay, thanks, Doctor. Uh, there's one more uh, follow-up question from, I guess, Rovina, but I'll just put it up and see whether, you know, what's, what's your feedback or your thoughts on it. Okay. Ah, this is my bugbear, insurance and children with disabilities. <laughs> I'm not a good friend of the insurance companies. When they see my name, they immediately blacklist the poor families. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, can I say something? Can can you guys lobby lobby the government? At one point, um, I think this was more than this was back probably in two thousand and twelve or thirteen. I was called to a roundtable discussion with um, organized by Dr. Uh, Topuan Aisha Ong, and she was trying to push this, and um, with there were the Ministry of Women's Welfare and Children. But I don't know what happened to it. Um, I think now, I think Takafu, if I'm not mistaken, am I right? Uh, yes. Takafu yes. Provide, provide some coverage. But I know GE in Singapore also provides some coverage, but it's still very limited. Um, uh, we have a way to go yet, I think. So yeah, so I just want to add uh, a comment to this, basically, because um, we we were, I mean, Nasom was working uh, closely. I mean, thanks to Anne uh, with uh, FWD Takafu, and uh, in fact, FWD Takafu came up with some form of uh, insurance coverage, right? But at this point of time, they still can't offer medical coverage. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, they, have, they have given us the reasons behind it, why they can't provide uh, insurance coverage, especially for autism, for example, as there's not enough data, apparently, not enough data of you know, the mortality rate and things like that um, and so forth. So there's, there's a lot of data that is missing from the insurance uh, company, which is why they are, they're very hesitant on, on providing any sort of coverage because insurance basically gives or, or insure people based on risk. So the higher risk you are, mm. um, the less, less likely they're going to insure you or otherwise the premium going to cost be very high. So, I mean, just for the audience sake uh, today, um, since, since this question was being asked, um, we are trying to work uh, with various parties. You know, firstly, we need to get the data. You know, so we're going to work with uh, a couple of universities and so forth like UITM you know, to, to, to do some research on uh, autistic people and so forth. So when we have this research paper um, done, and then we can actually go to the insurance company and said, you know, this is the data that we can present to you. You know, accident rates for autism are probably very less. And so I don't, I don't know what's the number because we have not done the research, right? Mm. Um, and, and so forth. So when we do have um, data, enough data, and then insurance company will be able to use the data and, and come up with a, a plan. Uh, insurance plan so this is definitely a, an, a challenge that uh, most parents have uh, faced or currently facing that they, they can't insure their their children 
um, and we are trying to fight for you know some some rights or benefits uh, so that all of our autism people could get insured. And and like what Dr. Rajini has mentioned, you no, know, maybe one one way is to go to the ministry, go to the government, and and discuss with them, and see how it can help because. I think not long ago there was an article or news published uh, in the U.S. Basically, they have actually enact, enacted a, a law to say that uh, insurance company have to uh, insure the autism uh, community. So it's yeah. a, it's a long shot uh, for us. You no, know, it's just a long journey for us to go and have various meetings with the government agencies, with insurance companies. But I just want to assure that. Um, we are doing the work uh, at this point of time, so so give us a bit more time. You know, we need to come up with the data and so forth. Um, hopefully, you know, soon enough we'll, we'll be able to convince at least one or two insurance companies to to provide some insurance. And also bear in mind, um, those who have offered you insurance and they said they can insure autism person, please read the fine print. Right? Be yeah. careful. Right? You may be able to buy them but you may have problem claiming later on. So please do not, uh, uh, you know, jump into conclusion or survey you want to go and buy insurance for, for a child. Just, just read through the fine print, ask a lot of questions um, because this is also coming from uh, somebody, FWD Takafu saying that um, just, just be careful because although you can buy, they may have issues in uh, claiming later on. So, so you may lose out by, by paying premiums, but you can't, you can't claim. And, and can I just add, Julian, you know, I know many families do not want to have the um, OKU card, but the OKU card gives your child free treatment in government hospitals, university hospitals. Um, yeah. So, you know, um, yeah, something to think about. Yeah, great. Thank you, Doctor, for your time. So, you know, we're, we're closing to 9, 9 uh, p.m. In fact, I've, I've learned something new from you today with regards to this um, nasal swap. Yeah. Uh, I was trying to look at various ways of how to get my son who is an Asperger because I, I was actually wanting to, to go back to Sabah for, to visit my family. And uh -huh. swap was one of the requirements. But then after that, we can't cross uh, interstate anymore. But... You, you were mentioning that there was a special swap that it's not so uh, irritating to the autistic person. I mean, it, it is irritating. Um, anything for that goes down your nose will be irritating. It's how you do it. And, and I think quite often it's distressing for parents. If you can imagine a person is not, if, if a child is not still and they're moving, the swap is going to cause more trauma. So... Yeah. We always say trying to calm the person down and explaining to them first what is going to happen. Um, the swab itself actually is flexible, but mm. having anything down your nose can be distressing. Saying that, I have done nasopharyngeal swabs for influenza in um, children on the autism spectrum. And using, okay, your son's older, but with the younger children using things like, um, you know, toys to distract them or fidget things and things like that helps. So, it, you know, always take, I always tell parents, if you have to go and see a doctor, take along something that you know will calm your, your child um, and see whether that can help. The problem is we can't do things like blow bubbles because the doctor has to be in PPE, so nobody can blow bubbles unless yeah. they have a bubble bubble gun. So you may want to offer to bring your bubble gun. Um, most health facilities don't have bubble guns. <laughs> but, um, you know, um, it can be done and it's about preparing your child beforehand. So we sometimes describe it as having a feather tickling your nose, okay? They may not understand it, but showing them... Um, pictures of children who have had it sometimes helps. So what's the average time to take this swap? Um, yeah, probably more than that. Okay, so some parents tell me, oh, but they twisted it 10 times. No, if, once you get in, an experienced person taking a swap will know um, when they've got a good thing. So they have to do both nostrils just in case sometimes um, or the and the throat. So, yeah. Okay. okay. I mean, thank you very much for your time, uh, Dr. Ranjini. I know you're very busy and uh, we are really, yeah. really glad to have it's you tonight. Been, 
it's to been a pleasure. Yeah. yeah. So so thank you so much uh, for the insightful sharing. Uh, hopefully, you know, we we be able to maybe organize future talks again in in some other topics and and um, you know let's 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 do that. Yeah, thank you everyone, and let's go out there and raise awareness. I think um, that's important. Don't know if you can hear me now. Oh, uh, we can hear you now. Anne. Would you like oh, to you make a closing me. statement? Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Rajini, and thank you, Julian, and it's been very insightful. We've, we've learned so much, and I really like, Dr. Rajini, how you gave us the historical side of it first, as in what's COVID, what do you need to do, and and you you actually psyched us up, <laughs> and, and then you actually told us uh, what can happen, what cannot happen, and we've learned so much, and there's so much more to 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 do actually to do and one of the things that you actually touch with a lot of people have not touched is about nutrition and how yeah. that affects the entire thing and i believe that you know we will definitely do more in our centers and we would uh you know create more awareness around this and uh thank you all for you know listening and um celebrate the autism month uh, you know spreading awareness and um and uh, being being kind to everyone, and wear your blue to actually so uh, show your support. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Thanks.